Hi there viewers. It's been a while since I made my last English video and I've had a number of new subscribers. Thank you very much for watching. I hope these videos are helpful for you. I started making these videos in 2019 after retiring as an ESL instructor for a community college here in Southern California. I was missing my students and I wanted to continue helping people in a way that I knew best by teaching English. After a while, I started thinking about other things I could be doing. Before I became an ESL teacher, I had an art degree and I had planned to be an artist. That didn't work out so well. So after making some of these grammar videos, I realized I could be painting. So that's what I've been doing and will continue doing as long as I can. I've thought about making more of these videos and I've made one or two since I started painting. I've answered some people's questions, but it's usually been in the form of responses in um, emails. Um, if you haven't noticed, I did create an email address just for my viewers here on this channel. And that email address is Alex's ESL world at google.com. Sorry, gmail.com. Mm. That's A L E X S E S L W O R L D at gmail.com. I created this just so we could communicate outside of YouTube. I don't plan to use your email addresses for anything except communication with you. So I'm not trying to make money off of these videos. I just want to be helpful to you. So recently, I received a comment that made me feel kind of like I should be doing more of these. The comment was just a question. Why did you stop making videos? That's a good question. Um, I answered, but I kept thinking about this and wondering if maybe I should be doing some more of these videos. And then that same subscriber asked me to explain linguistic parsing. I've never been asked about this before. So I started to write out an answer, but decided that I should make a new video to explain this. Maybe someone else will find it useful too. So Ahmet Soydan, please forgive me if I mispronounced your name. This is for you. I'm going to start by defining the two words in the expression linguistic parsing. Linguistic is an adjective that refers to language or linguistics. Notice that when you add an S, it becomes a noun, linguistics. Um, it looks like a plural noun, but it, it's singular. These two words, linguistics and language, mean the same thing pretty much. Keep in mind, in English, we don't show singularity or plurality in adjectives or adverbs. You might wonder, what's the difference between these two words? That is linguistic and language. Language refers to the system of communication used by a particular group of people. It includes vocabulary, grammar, and syntax, or how we put words together. It's used to convey meaning and express thoughts and feelings. Linguistics is a noun. Without the S, it's an adjective. For example, we might talk about a linguistic study. Linguistics, on the other hand, is a scientific study of language, including its structure, history, and variation. Okay, that's linguistic and linguistics, but what is parsing? Parsing is a verb, and it means dividing a sentence into grammatical parts and identifying the parts and their relationship to each other. Parsing can also mean to examine something in a very minute way. In most cases, you don't need to use the word linguistic with parsing, um, but if you want to be sure that the meaning's clear, you can use linguistic parsing. So to review, linguistic means having to do with language and parsing 
means dividing a sentence into grammatical parts and identifying the parts and their relationship to each other. It can also mean analyzing critically. I should mention that parsing is a term uh, used in writing computer programs also, but I wouldn't put them in the same category of linguistic parsing. Computer programmers might, but I'm not knowledgeable enough about computer programming to be able to explain that well, so I'm not gonna use it now. There are other situations where parsing is used. Uh, for example, statistical parsing. I'm gonna skip that one too. It's not linguistic parsing. So let's look now at how linguistic parsing works. The easiest and most used type of linguistic parsing is sentence diagrams. First, you need to have a good understanding of the different parts of speech. Just to refresh your memory, let's look at some of the basic parts of speech. We start off with nouns. Nouns are words that name people, like Mr. Smith or the Chinese. Places, such as Paris or home. Things, like baseball or computer and ideas, for example, opinion or plan. Words such as cat, Mexico, idea, and law are all nouns, even the ones that are not actual things that you can see and touch, like law, for example. There are verbs. These are action words, words that tell you what's going on, what's happening. A couple of examples are walk and study. Even though study isn't very physically strenuous, it's still an action verb. The other type of verb is what we call verbs of being. Examples of those are to be and to think. Another part of speech is adjectives. These are words that describe or give information about the nouns or pronouns. In English, we place the adjective before the noun. Examples are red, as in a red apple, and young, as in a young girl. There are also adverbs. These describe verbs, of course, but they can also modify other adverbs and also adjectives. An example of an adverb describing a verb is, Jack plays guitar beautifully. Notice this word ends in L-Y. Many adverbs have this suffix, but not all do. An example of an adverb describing another adverb is, Sally drives very fast. We know that fast is an adverb because it tells us how Sally drives, but when we wish to talk about how fast Sally drives, we use the adverb very. Both fast and very are adverbs. And an example of an adverb describing an adjective we could say, the children are always quiet. Always is the adverb, and it describes quiet, which is an adjective. Two parts of speech that are used a lot in English and are usually very small words are articles and prepositions. Let's look first at articles. Articles are words that identify nouns. We don't use them with any other part of speech. There are two indefinite articles, and they are a and an. A comes before a word that begins with a consonant, like a cat, a boat, or a piano. If we use an adjective with a noun, then we have to go by the first letter of the adjective instead of the noun. We use an before a noun that begins with a vowel, or an adjective that be begins with a vowel. We do this because it would sound strange to say a apple. It's easier to say an apple. It's also correct to say an apple. If we want to describe the apple, we might say a red apple. That's fine because red begins with a cons consonant. If the apple is orange, it would be a weird apple. But grammatically, we'd say an orange apple. Indefinite articles mean there isn't a particular one. In this case, I could be talking about any orange apple in the world. This is just one of them. 
Oh, and the meaning of a or an is simply one. In some languages, people use the same word for a and one. As for the definite article, well, there's only one, and that word is the. Did you know that the is the most used English word? The means one particular thing. For example, we say, the painting I like most from Van Gogh is Starry Night. I'm not really sure if that's my favorite. I love Van Gogh, and yes, that's how we say his name in American English, Van Gogh. Finally, prepositions. These are mostly tiny words that tell us something about time or place. They're very common. Some examples of prepositions are of, by, in, and between. These are often used with nouns to form noun phrases or prepositional phrases. Some examples. Plenty of money. That's what Elon Musk has. There's also, by the time I get home, in my suitcase, between now and later. Okay, that's enough about parts of speech. Now let's finally take a look at parsing. Linguistic parsing can be very complicated. It is sometimes used in various complex analysis, such as discourse analysis and in psycholinguistics. The easiest and maybe the most common use is by using sentence diagrams. It's a good way to break down a sentence to understand the meaning better. There are different ways to diagram a sentence. I learned that in grad school. I had been taught sentence diagramming in school as a child, but in graduate level studies, I learned that it can be much more complicated than I had learned as a child. I'm going to stick with the simple way I learned a long time ago. I'm going to use a sentence as example and show you how to diagram it. Here's the sentence. The server brought me a delicious dessert at my favorite restaurant. We're going to start out with the subject, which is the noun server. If you don't know what a server in a restaurant is, it's what we used to call a waiter. So we're going to take that noun and write it on a line. After that, we're going to draw a vertical line and put it after the subject, like this. Then we write the verb on the line with the subject. The verb is brought. Next, we're going to add the direct object. A direct object is a noun or pronoun that shows who or what is acted on by the subject doing whatever the verb is. In this case, we know the server brought something and that's the dessert. So dessert is our direct object. We need to put that on the same line as the subject and verb. This time, we draw a vertical line between the verb and the direct object, but we only draw it to the line, not through the line. This is how it looks. Next, we're going to add the indirect object. An indirect object is a noun, pronoun, or noun phrase that shows who or what is receiving the direct object. Not all sentences have one of those, but this one does. It's me. Indirect objects go on a small horizontal line under the verb, connected by a diagonal line. It looks like this. Next, we're going to look at prepositions. As you can see, the preposition itself, in this case, at, goes on a diagonal line under the word it describes. So we have at this point at, under the verb, under the verb brought, because at tells us where the dessert was brought. The preposition goes on a diagonal line to connect the verb brought to the noun that tells where that something was brought. And we put restaurant on the line to show where it was brought. First, let's finish with the prepositional phrase. We still have my and favorite. My tells us something about my relationship with the restaurant. It's not my restaurant, but it is my favorite restaurant. So, we're going to put my under restaurant on a slanting line, and we're going to add favorite to another line under restaurant. Both of these words give us important meaning for restaurant. 
I probably should have put the first word of the sentence, the, under the word it modifies, which is server. It looks like this. Next, we have another article, which is a, and it modifies dessert. Finally, we have an adjective that describes dessert, and it's delicious. By the way, you might have noticed the pronunciation of a is a little odd. <clears throat> when we're talking about the word or the letter, we say a. When we use that letter to be a word, we pronounce it a. Uh. It's just American pronunciation. Diagramming sentences like this will help us to understand how the words work together and what they mean. Of course, if there's an unfamiliar word, there's nothing like a dictionary to help us out too. If you need more help or more complex uh, instruction, I'm adding a link to a helpful website below. I hope this video is helpful for you. I can't promise I'll keep making videos, but if you have something that you need help with, feel free to write to me and ask. I might be able to answer you in an email, or I might decide to make more videos. Who knows? For now, remember to be kind to each other. We need more kindness in the world. Take care. Bye-bye.